cat out of the bag a couple weeks ago about this morning. I'm sorry, I got to take these glasses off. They make my eyeballs sweat. <laughs> but I, I asked the preacher, I said, would you mind if I brought the message on Sunday morning, October the 9th? He said, what's so special about that day? <laughs> I said, well, if I tell you, I got to kill you. <laughs> so I think he, I think I kind of let him know something was up. But Cindy, I bit my tongue. I didn't tell him exactly what was going on, okay? She says, sometimes I cannot keep a secret. So he's allowed me the honor. And again, every time he allows me to stand here, it is an honor for me. It's not something that I take lightly. It's not something that I... Like he said, he cherishes these books. I cherish the opportunities I get to stand behind this pulpit or even if Eric's allowed me to stand behind the pulpit at College Park. Uh, I went and did a men's meet for them several weeks ago. I forgot to tell you, I'm sorry. Uh, it was kind of sprung on me a couple days before I needed to be there. So, uh, But uh, I want to preach a message this morning. I want to bring a message to you this morning. And I'm not going to have you stand because I'm going to be reading quite a bit of scripture this morning. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn over with me to uh, 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. And I guess, if, I guess if there was a title for my message this morning, it would be... Is the mic still down here? Yep. Sorry, Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. Sorry. If there, if there was a title for this message this morning, it would be The Courage to Fight. Hey, kids. I think the, yeah, I think the preacher's telling me it's time to bominos. Bominos. Yeah. Unless y'all just want to stay out here, but if you stay out here, I expect you to be quiet. Never mind. Hey, Waylon, Matthew, y'all want to go back to the back? Y'all want to go play? Knock yourself out. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Y'all see that? Y'all see what he did? Yep. Yep. It's a, hey, it's okay for us to step in every now and again and let the preacher, Miss Brittany, sit down and just and just relax, right? Amen. So, let me. Can you? I'm used. I should be used to these, right? Oh Lord, there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right, so uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 17, we'll, we'll, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Like I said, I'm not going to have you stand because I'm going to be reading all the way down to verse number 51. I want you to get the gist of this story this morning as we move forward. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shocho, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shocho and Azekah, and uh, I don't even know how to say that, uh, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to put my glasses back on because I cannot read this small print. If you've seen the font on my notes, you'd know why. It's like that big. That's the reason I guess it turned out to be 28 pages of notes, huh? There we go. I can see now. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then 
will be, we will be your servants, but if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among, among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to, to the battle were Elab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shema. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself for forty days. And Jesse said unto, his, said unto David, his son, Take now for thy breath, brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousands of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. So Jesse was going to send David down to the battle to his brothers and take them some tortillas and some loaf bread and some cheese so they can make them a cheese sandwich, right? Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath, by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killed him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Elab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Elab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the, right, and the, and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. I think our preacher knows this better than anybody. I think some of us are starting to see it too. When we try to stand for what is right, what is biblical, what is, we know to be the truth, the word of God, the true word of God, people are going to get mad, boy. They'll get angry. We ain't going to make everybody happy. What's the old saying? You can't make everybody happy all the time, but you can make some people happy some of the time? Well, let me tell you something. When we've got a preacher like we do, and you try and you preach this word for word, not adding or taking away from it, then guess what? People ain't gonna like it. People are not gonna like it. And David said, "What have I now done? Is there not a cause?" And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. Verse thirty-one. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of, the, out of his mouth. 
And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. He also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I can not go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. Script, And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare his shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistines said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to, David, to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon the, his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Let's pray. Fathers, I come to you this morning. Lord, I pray, God, that you would move me out of the way. And I pray, Father, that you would allow no spirit but the Holy Spirit to move here. Lord, I pray, God, that something that's said here this morning may encourage someone. Lord, I pray, God, that you just be in this service. We ask that you get the honor and glory from whatever's said here today. We thank you for our pastor and his family. We thank you for his stand on the Bible. Help us, Father God, to stand behind him and support him, even in the difficult times, Lord, and we know they're going to come. We ask it and pray it in your precious name. Amen. Now, I'm a John Wayne fan. I'll tell you right quick, like I'm a John Wayne fan. Cindy can't stand it when I go to watch a John Wayne movie. But John Wayne had a saying, and I've, heard, I've used it before in a, in, a, in a previous message. John Wayne said, Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. But Cindy can't stand it when I turn them on. Are you watching that again? Are you watching that again? I'm like, look here, man. At least I'm watching something from this century, you know? Unlike the 30s movies that she likes to watch every night again. See, as uh, 1 Samuel 17 started, we see that Saul and the armies of Israel were on one side of the valley, and the Philistines with their champion, Goliath, was on the other side. <clears throat> and, and in the whole his army of Saul, there was not one man, one man that had enough backbone and guts to go and stand against Goliath. Not one of them. Not one. But see, <clears throat> I began to research this thing out, and I wanted to know exactly how tall Goliath was. And I've seen several different answers. i found several different answers. But basically, the consensus was that he was at least nine foot tall. 
Nine foot, nine inches is what I, what I figured. Of course, I Googled it because I ain't that smart. I took general math all the way up to 12th grade, okay? I, I pre-algebra and algebra and second algebra, third algebra, I couldn't pass the pre, so just put me in general math. But he was, he was over nine feet tall, okay? So that'd be like TJ, that'd be like Lil Whalen looking, standing face to face with Brother TJ. Just to give you a comparison. See, from what I could find, David's height was probably somewhere around maybe five feet. Now, I've seen several different things that said Goliath's armor alone could have weighed between 150 to 300 pounds. And you got a little guy that's five foot tall, maybe five foot, maybe a little under, maybe a little over, going to stand against this guy that's over nine feet tall. And see, verse 42 tells us that David was a youth, but a youth and ruddy, meaning David's skin was reddish. And from what, what research, when I was studying this thing out a little bit, you know, all the men at that time, just they longed to have that complexion like David. They did. They wanted that red hair. They wanted that smooth complexion, kind of like I got, you know. Yeah, that boyish face. Yeah. Uh, but all the men at that time wanted that. But see... When you look at, the, look at the comparison between David and Goliath, I mean, you look at David and you're like, sorry, David kind of looked like a little pretty boy. He's not the type of person you would think that would go and stand against a guy that's over nine foot tall. You would think that somebody within Saul's army would have enough guts and backbone to say, hey, I got this. I can take him. At this time, see, David was somewhere between the age of 12 and 19. I do know that from, from studying out that he was definitely under 20 because at that time you had to be at the age, age 20, you had to be 20 years old before you could join Saul's army. So we know that he was under that age because he, three of his brothers had already joined Saul and joined the army. So God was going to use David, though, in the face of what seemed like an insurmountable odds. He was going to use a shepherd boy as opposed to a hardened soldier to carry out his will. I'm flipping through these things fast. I want to get to some of the Texas Roadhouse rolls. Yeah. First thing I want us to see real quick is David's courage. In verse 34 and 36, the courage that David had while he was watching his father's sheep. See, 34 and 35, sorry, I feel like I got gnats or something flying on my face. Sorry. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Now David, even though his, he was small in stature, he was still a bad dude. I mean, because I ain't going to lie to you. He's got more guts than I got to go out after a sheep. I'd be like, nah, he can have it. Nah, you, can, you just take it. You just take it on. I'm not coming after you. But he killed a lion and a bear. He killed a lion and a bear. So he, again, he had to be a pretty bad little dude. <clears throat> See, David wasn't a war hard soldier like all the guys in Saul's army was. But see, he had already proven his courage. He knew the courage that he had. He knew that, hey, wasn't me. Wasn't me that done it. It was, it was God that done it. See, God was going to use a small shepherd boy and his courage to face down Goliath when no other man had the guts to do it. Second thing I want us to see this morning was David's confidence. 1 Samuel 17, 32 says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. See, David had already seen what God had brought him through when he killed the lion and the bear. So he, he, he was like, hey, God's got this. He was confident. So he had already knew that God had brought him through this battle and this battle and this battle and that battle. And he was trusting God with the battle to come. Now sometimes, I don't know about y'all, but for me personally, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, when we go through... It, it, we, we seem to forget as Christians and look back at what God has already brought us through. So when we come to something that seems like a, 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 a Goliath in, in our path, we want to forget that, hey, God's already, we've already, God's already brought us through these over here. 
We've already faced these giants down over here, but God can't help me with this one. I'm guilty of that. Are y'all? I'm guilty of it. Because why? Why? We forget about all the past battles. Mom had a bad habit of this. I can say this now. She's gone. Love you. Mom had a bad habit, man. I'm going to tell you what. She'd forget everything you had done for her the week before. Bless God, y'all just don't do nothing for me no more. You could be on went to Walmart 15 times in a week. Because she forgot to add something to her Walmart list. Well, now I got to go back over here. Or I got. Or she wants me to run the Dollar General. Then I got to go to Walmart for it. Then she's found this on sale at Food Line. Bless God, y'all just don't do nothing for me no more. I'm like, Mom, I just, I just run like a half a tank of gas out running all over Lancaster County getting stuff for you. Yeah, I guess you did. But see, Mom would... It's, it's like us with, 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 as Christians, though. We forget about all that stuff God's brought us through. As soon as we stand in face to face with a new giant. <clears throat> See, we in my cup, please. Throat's a little dry. It's right there. Some water or something. Dip a cup in the back of the toilet or something. I'm, I'm about to die up here. Thank you. I know why you keep that air on 67 now. Uh, thank you. Zig Ziglar had a, a saying that says, your attitude determines your altitude. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, don't it? So if I walk around here defeated, and I forget that I'm serving the God that spoke the earth, the moon, the stars, and all that stuff into existence, and I'm walking around here with a defeated spirit because <laughs> I just don't know how I'm going to make it through this, man. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And guess what? I'm going to convey that to everybody. I could come in here with a bad attitude on a Sunday morning because maybe me and her got in an argument, which is very seldom anymore because honestly, we, it's just not worth the effort no more, is it? She just, she just... She just right. Yeah, pretty much. I just let it go. So, but if, if we come in here with a nasty attitude... Brother TJ's going to sense it. Brother Frank's going to sense it. Miss Michelle's going to sense it. Preacher's going to sense it. Well, next thing you know, I've, I've spread that like a stinking virus, like the COVID, like the Kung flu in here. Because I've walked in with a bad attitude. And the worst thing is, is when we walk out of church, we carry that same nasty attitude with us when we go to whatever restaurant we go to. And the next thing you know, it's rubbed off of us. And then the next thing you know, why'd you look over her? <laughs> I won't say anything. Uh, but we've, we've carried that attitude with us to where now, next thing you know, we've said something or done something that's not very Christian-like. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. So if we walk around with that negative, nasty attitude, guess what we're going to get? Negative, nasty, just a nasty, nasty attitude. I mean... It's going to be, you're going to convey that, or well, guess what you're going to get in return? You're going to get the same thing in return, right? But see, we, as Christians, we're supposed to be happy, right? We're saved. If we've accepted Christ as our Savior, we're supposed to be walking around. I ain't saying you've got to walk around smiling all the time, because let's be honest, there's just sometimes we're still flesh and bone. And there's just sometimes you cannot put a smile on your face. I don't care how hard you try. Because whatever you're going through, it's just beating you down so bad. But I, I've had the privilege of knowing some people like that in my life to where it didn't matter what they were going through. You, you couldn't tell they were going through nothing because they always walked around with a smile on their face. And instead of them wanting encouragement from you when they were going through something, they were the ones that were encouraging me. Hey, man, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm praying for you. I'm thankful for those people that God placed in my life. See, God, God's got a plan and purpose for everything, right? God's not going to, I'm not going to say that God's not going to give us more than we can bear because sometimes that's not true. God's going to place stuff on us just to see how we're going to react. He's going to test our faith. He's going to test us to a point to where, hey, I want to see if you've got enough faith to make it through this thing. And sometimes that's all you're going to have left is, God, is the faith that God's going to bring you through it. I know when this thing all started with Cindy's, with Cindy's health. Man, I'm going to tell you what. 
when it all, before it, when it all started and we got out and we went to her primary care, well, of course, you know, we had no clue what was going on. No idea. All I knew is that my wife was sick and I couldn't fix it. Because, guys, we want to fix it, right? But I couldn't fix it with duct tape. I couldn't fix it with Gorilla Glue. Gl gl excuse me, Gorilla Glue. I couldn't fix it with a ratchet. I couldn't fix it with a screwdriver. I couldn't fix it. But I knew something was wrong. Something was wrong. We go to the doctor. The doctor says, well, it could be this, could be this. And, of course, what did he do? He threw the cancer word in there. I'm thinking, Lord, I just, I mean, we ain't been married, but less than, what, 20 years? She's got cancer now. See, God, that was before I got saved. See, that was God trying to get my attention. Hey, it's, it's, not, it's not about you. you. You need to just let me deal with this. But see, that's hard for us to do a lot of times. It's hard for us to just let it go and let God deal with it. <laughs> Mom had another saying, like I said earlier before, you know, she could tell when we were going through stuff. Moms are funny that way, right? She would always say, look, God's got a purpose. And God's got a plan for everything that He allows you to go through. You just got to trust Him. Well, I heard another pastor seven, eight years ago preach a message. <laughs> no, it's been longer than that. It's been probably 11 or 12 years ago. Preach a message. He said, look, I can stand here and I can tell you I know what you're going through. I know what you're... Pro I, know, I know it. No, I don't. He said, until I'm standing inside of your situation, until I'm standing there in the same position you are, he said, I can't tell you what you're going through. He said, all I can tell you is I love you and I'm praying for you. But see, God's got a purpose and a plan for everything He allows to come in our lives. Mom said it don't matter how small, how big. Everything's got a purpose. Everything's got a plan. God's got a plan for everything. The third thing I want us to see, moving along quickly here, because I, I tell you I want them rolls, is I want us to see David's faith. 1 Samuel 17, 37 says, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he would deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with me. Or excuse me, be with thee. See, David had already, Saul, he had reaped, so to speak, the fruit of his faith in God. When God delivered him out of the hand and the mouth of the lion and the bear. See, faith is going to carry us through a lot of times in our life when we just think it's too hard and too difficult. Luke one thirty seven says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. See, faith is up to us as individuals, okay? I can tell you all day long, again, hey, you just got to trust God. You just got to trust God. You just got to trust God. But until I've went through what you're going through, that stuff goes in one ear and out the other ear. Because when we were going through this whole thing with her, people would say, hey, look, you just got to trust God. I, I heard that so much, man, I got tired of hearing it. I got, it got to the point when somebody told me that, it made me mad. Because I was seeing what my wife was going through and I, see, I was seeing what my wife was suffering with and somebody would come and say, hey, you just got to trust God with it, man. Just trust God. I want to say, hey, shut up. It ain't your wife. It's my wife. Don't tell me to stand there and just trust God with it. But you know what? After I got saved and the more I got to realize, hey, I do need to trust God with this thing. We just need to trust God together as a couple, right? And that's what we've done. That's what we've learned to do. Was it easy? Nope. Not going to lie to you. Because there for a while, it was like every two or three months, man. It was like, what's, what's wrong now? What's wrong now? <laughs> took her to one of her doctor, primary care, pr took her to her primary care doctor one day and walked in. He said, dude, can't you just bring her to me with something like the flu or a cold? I'm like... I said, look, Doc, Mom said go big or go home. But when I learned to start putting my faith that God has got this no matter what, and, and honestly, it's gotten a whole lot easier since I accepted Christ. We're, we're living and we're, we're, we're trying to live our life for Christ as best we can. I'm trying to, go, I'm trying to do the best I can in, in ministry, and I'm honestly, I'm just... She's got some stuff going on right now with her, with her joints. And I'm like, you know what? 
I'm not going to worry about it. God brought her into my life. She's God's anyway. God placed her here. God wants her back. He's going to take her back. But I don't think he's going to do that because I think he's going to leave her here for me to harass for another 27 years. What do you think? You hope so, right? See, remember a couple weeks ago, the preacher was taking us through the book of Daniel, right? And we saw how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown in that fiery furnace. I mean, it's so hot. When the strong men threw them in there, what happened? Smote them, killed them, right? Well, when the old king looked over there, he said, hey, man, hey, man, I thought we threw three guys in here. He said, uh, why is he four down there? See, they didn't back down because they had the faith that their God would bring them through. The same thing with Daniel. When, they, when the king said, hey, no more praying. You can't pray. Daniel said, mm, watch me. What did he do? He had enough courage to say, hey, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray three times a day. And he opened his window and he prayed. What happened when he got caught? Threw him in a lion's den. Was he scared? I don't know. I wasn't there. Probably. You throw me in a den of lions, I'm probably going to get jacked up a little bit. I'm probably going to scream like a little girl. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm probably going to do a little crying. But Daniel had enough faith that, hey, God has already brought, us through, brought me through all this other stuff in my past. Well, guess what? He's got this. He's got it. He's got it. And see, that same faith is the same faith. The same faith that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego. We could have that faith. Why don't we? You know why? We're flesh and blood. None of us are perfect. We're all susceptible to fear, anxiety, all that good stuff. But see... Psalms 34, 17 says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. See, it doesn't say, that verse doesn't say some. It says all, right? What's a good, what's a good definition for all? Eric, you said this all the time when he was here. What's a good definition of all? All. All covers everything, right? So, it's up to us, though, to trust God's plan. It's up to us to have enough faith that, hey, God's going to bring me through that. Just like David did when he faced the lion, the bear, and eventually faced Goliath. Matthew 17, 20 says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Hmm. Our preacher preaches the Bible word for word, right? I'm pretty sure this is still relevant today. If we had the faith to move a mountain, the Bible says what the Bible says, right? I think, I think part of our problem in our society, though, is these things right here. We've got so much garbage in our lives. We've allowed so much garbage to creep into our Christian lives. I think my light's on. I'm not sure. But we've allowed so much garbage to creep in our Christian lives that we have gotten so far distracted that we can't see God as clear as we used to. Maybe our relationship with Him is just not what it used to be. Maybe we're not as close to Him as we used to be. Well, guess who moved? It wasn't God. It wasn't God. It was us. I think this is my last point, I promise. Somebody's alarm's going off. Point four is I want to see David's deliverance. <laughs> Yeah, probably did. First Samuel seventeen forty eight through fifty says, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag. Let me dig in my pocket here. Took out a took out thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in the forehead. That the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling, with the stone. And smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. I said it earlier. See, David done something that none of the other men in Saul's army were willing to do. He faced down that giant. 
He was willing to stand in and face down that giant. Why? One, because he had faith. He had already saw what God had brought him through, and he knew that if he just kept trusting God, God was going to bring him through this. God would bring him through this as well. See, David understood something from the beginning that the battle was God's. It was not his. It was not David's to have, but it was God's battle to have. And David knew that God's got this. Psalms 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. There was no other way that David could have made it through this, right? Unless God was in it. There was no other way. 1 Samuel 17, 49 says, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead. See, I honestly believe as soon as that stone left that sling, I, either he was a outst- he was a hawk, what is that, what was they call it? And more, yeah, he was a hawk eye. Now, he's got to be a bad dude to be running because my Bible says he ran. The next verse didn't say he stopped and done all that. So apparently he was doing this on the run. And for him to sling a stone and catch that joker right there, he's a bad dude. But I honestly believe that God guided that stone. Again, everything that fell into place was because God allowed it to fall into place. God guided that stone. There was no way, Dave, I'm sorry, I just don't think David was that good of a shot. There's no way. See, nothing's changed. That same God that delivered David is the same God that's sitting on the throne today. Only thing that's changed is we have. Sorry. Got distracted. Christians see our, our faith has become weaker. Our courage has become rattled. And sometimes we just, you know, we just ain't, we just ain't got the courage that we need to fight. We need to keep on keeping on. But this morning, I want to tell you that the same God that gave Goliath into David's hands is that same God that sits on the throne this morning. It's the same God. He hasn't changed. We've changed. We've changed. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know whatever giants you're facing or whatever battles you're facing this morning, but I believe that we're very, very soon, very, very soon, I believe that that trumpet's going to sound. And we're going to be called to meet Jesus in the air. And honestly, I don't believe it's going to be, I don't believe it's going to be very long. The Bible tells us when it happens, it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. That means you ain't going to have a lot of time to get it right. God's grace is still in place this morning. But he is not going to be much longer. And I think he's going to tell Jesus, hey, they've had enough. They've had enough. So I ask you this morning, if you don't know that you know that you know that you know that you know that if death were to take your body, if you walked out that door this morning, if you don't know, get it right this morning. Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning. God is best to know how. Lord, I felt like I was stammering and stumbling and my thoughts just couldn't get together. But I I pray, God, that they didn't see me. I pray that they saw you. Lord, I pray, God, that you would give our church the courage to keep fighting. Give us the strength to to carry on. In those times when we, we come in and the number's small because of sickness or whatever, Lord, I pray, God, that you would give us the courage to keep fighting. Be with our pastor, Lord. I pray that you would give him the courage to just keep on fighting. Lord, we know, God, that we're, we're so close to the end. We know, God, that there's coming a day when, you're gonna, when that trumpet's going to sound. And, Lord, I pray if there's one here this morning who's unsure where they're going to spend eternity, I pray that you would just speak to their heart. Lead us, God. God us, use us. We ask it in your name. We do pray. Amen.